About a year ago, I pulled up to one of our local fast food drive throughs to pick up a donut before heading to the hospital for an early morning surgery visit of one of our church members. And since I had already had a cup of coffee that morning, I ordered a bottle of milk to wash it all down. For one reason or another, maybe I was still waking up or maybe I just have a little more or too much faith in humanity. I didn't think twice about twisting open the cap and taking a big gulp of that milk immediately. Mm, I knew something was wrong. I think it smelled, I smelled it before I tasted it. But when I tasted it, it was all over. I choked it down because I couldn't get to the window in time to spit it all out. I turned the bottle over and checked the expiration date. Two weeks expired past shelf life. Yeah, I was in a hurry so much that I didn't have time to go in and chew them out. But I just drove off and threw the bottle of milk away later. I wouldn't have chewed them out. Well, I don't know. Maybe I would have. (laughs) That same week... On a similar morning, I again pulled up to the same fast food drive-thru to pick up a donut before heading to the hospital for an early morning surgery visit of one of our church members. And since I had already had a cup of coffee that morning, I ordered a bottle of milk to wash it all down a second time. For, the, for one reason or another, maybe I just have a little too much trust in humanity, or maybe because I'm a total idiot, which is probably the case, I didn't think twice about twisting open the cap and taking a big gulp of that milk. Same song, second verse, except this time it was two weeks and a couple of days past the shelf life, and I had a little more time on my hands, so I parked the car, went inside, politely told them about my last two visits, and watched as they threw out over a dozen bottles of milk from their shelf. What's the moral of the story? Never drink a bottle of milk that I buy from you at Dunkin' Donuts, number one. But seriously, it is something that we don't like to think about and we don't like to talk much about, but we have an expiration date. It was stamped on every human the very second that Adam and Eve bit into the fruit that God had told them that it would only bring them death. We have an expiration date. And that knowledge of our mortality can do one of two things to you. One of two things can happen with this understanding that we have an expiration date. Number one, it could spur you to live a better, more fuller life, or it could paralyze you into never living your life. The Apostle Paul knew full well the fragility of life. By his testimony in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he faced many near-death experiences. In that passage of scripture, he relays that he was whipped five different times. He was beaten with, rod on, uh, beaten with rods three different occasions. He was stoned once. He was shipwrecked three different times. And on one of those occasions, he spent 24 hours in the water waiting for rescue, knowing that He would one day die, though, was one of the things I believe that pushed Paul forward in his life. In fact, he wrote in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, he says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He saw the end of his life equal to the upward call of God. Man, I wish I consistently had that same viewpoint in my life. I wish I equated my death, my expiration date with that time when God will call me up with him. Sometimes when we hear something like death equaling the upward call of God, we accuse that person who is saying that, that they're too spiritual. You've probably heard it before. Maybe you've even said it yourself that they are so heavenly minded that they are no earthly good. Well, Paul was far from that. He was very much good for our world. Christ used him greatly. The inspired Paul, uh, he, he left believers several different directives on how to live practically and spiritually in this world. And I don't think that there are any that will thrust us into the year 2018 None better than Ephesians chapter 5. We've read it already in our scripture reading, but let's again look to verses 15 through 21. 
He, he writes, see then that you walk circumspectly or carefully, not as fools, but as wise. Verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting, verse 21, to one another and the fear of God. These verses provide a, a unique outline for our lives to follow. I call it an outline, but really it's just one final command that Paul gives to the Christians there in Ephesus and to us today as we are entering this new year. And from that final command, Paul will write a little more ex explanation as to what it means to live by that command. For today, especially, I want us to apply it as to how we ought to live this year. I know that it's almost been a full week since the new year, and most of us probably can't even remember the resolutions that we made last week, much less that we've made good on them or we've stayed faithful to them. But how does Paul tell us as 2018 Christians, how ought we to live this year? What's that final command he gives us? It's be careful. Walk circumspectly. That's what he writes there in verse 15, the very first part. Walk carefully. What? Are, are, you, are you sure that this is the same Paul? The whipped, beaten, stoned, shipwrecked Paul? Why is he telling us to be careful? Paul, you ought to be a little more careful. I would think twice about getting on a boat if I was shipwrecked once, much less three times. Maybe you ought to be a little more careful, Paul. But the problem here is that we have a misunderstanding of what Paul means when he says for us to walk circumspectly or for us to walk carefully. What he is saying here is to be careful in our Christian walk. Here's, let me try to relay it this way. The Winter Olympics, they're coming up in a month and I'm pumped. I love the Olympics. I especially love the Winter Olympics. I told Rachel the other day it's because I can actually do one of those sports that they're involved. I can ski. I like skiing. I can't do any of the Summer Olympics at all. No, I can't even run. Uh, but I love the Winter Olympics, and they involve hundreds, hundreds of athletes all over the world who take risks in order to bring glory to their country, to make a name for themselves, to make their parents proud. And in the Summer Olympics, our family, especially Claire, loves watching gymnastics. And the balance beam is one of those sports that I always find myself asking, how did they even learn to do that without breaking their neck first, right? Like how can you, do, what was the process and how you learned to do a backflip on, on that little small piece of wood? How did that happen? They're going to do flips and they'll do handstands and toe touches and all the things that none of us can do on regular ground, but they'll just do it on five inches of wood. But here's something that you'll never see in the Olympics. You will never see an athlete get on the beam, hug it until the time expires, and then jump off with this dismount of, ta-da, <laughs> after having just clung to it for the minute of their quote-unquote routine. I think sometimes we read Paul's command for us to be careful, to walk circumspectly, walk carefully, and we walk our lifetime balance beam routine hugging the beam, only to die and get to heaven with this dismount bow. I did all this for you, Jesus! Aren't you pleased? And our routine, our life, was basically just hugging the beam. Paul's not talking about living safely. He is talking about walking carefully, though. In fact, that's one of the last things that he means is to be safe. So what does it mean to walk carefully in this Christian life? He explains it when he tells us to walk carefully 
wisely. That verse goes on in verse 15. It says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Paul isn't calling for Christians to circle the wagons, to start a commune, to hug the beam, to live just us for no more, holy huddle kind of group. He's not calling us to do that. He's saying that as you walk through this world, be wise. Proverbs says that a very big part of being wise is thinking slowly. Don't be brash. Be intentional. Don't be wasteful of your life. Be careful. Walk circumspectly. In fact, that's exactly what it means by walking wisely. He he tells us that the explanation of that is to redeem the time you have. Verse 16 goes on, redeeming the time because the days are evil. There's a number of Greek words that Paul could have used in this verse when he talked about time. But he used the term, the word kairos. Kairos. It refers to a set time, a measured, allocated, fixed season. Essentially, Paul is saying for us to buy up for yourself every bit of the measured time that you have on this earth. While he refers to our lifespan time through this use of kairos, our time on this world, it's helpful for us to remember that our lifetime is made up of ticks on a clock. Chronos, another Greek word that he uses at another point. The idea being that you're not going to redeem your whole lifespan time here if you're not going to redeem every second of the day. If you're not going to buy it, take it captive, take it to the bank, and use that second, your whole life will not be redeemed either. Here's what I mean to try to bring it down a little bit more. 62 years ago tomorrow, five promising, talented young men about my age were martyred for their faith in Christ in the jungles of Ecuador. Jim Elliott was 28 when his kairos, his measured, allocated, fixed, set time was up. He's one of the most prolific and inspiring missionaries of our day. He was an excellent writer and a charismatic preacher. His diary eerily rang with prophetic promise of his own death when he wrote, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He looks at his life and he says, why, why wouldn't I spend, waste my life for the gospel when I can gain a relationship with Jesus? I'm no fool. Many other powerful quotes are attributed to him that inspire us to walk wisely by buying up every second of the time that The Lord has allotted us. He wrote once, man is invincible until God is finished with him. Man is invincible until God is finished with him. The idea of why should I be scared? If God wants me to live, then I'll live. If God wants me to die, then I'll die. Why wouldn't I spend my life in the jungles of Ecuador, ministering to people who, who hate me and they don't like the way I look and they bring in, I bring in a different society and they're scared of me and they'll ultimately kill me. Why wouldn't I spend my life doing that? Because if God wants me dead, then I'm going to die on my sofa. Man is invincible until God is finished with him. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Interestingly enough, Paul further explains what it means to redeem the time there. I've only given you two of those Jim Elliot quotes. Hold on for another. In verse 17, he tells us, Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And so the question might be to you this morning, so What does it mean to redeem the time that God's given me? How do I redeem it? Is there a coupon that I can take? I mean, how do I redeem my time? 
Paul writes that it's by understanding God's will for my life. By understanding God's will for my life. I think Jim Elliott's most powerful quote that I've tried to apply to my life was his plea to young people to answer the call of God on their life. He wrote, wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. Wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. Eliot understood, and it would be good for us to be reminded, that God's will is not a place that we find ourselves in, nor is it a person for us to marry or invest in. I can't tell you the thousands of times that I've heard it before, someone speaking of God's will as almost as if it's the spiritual carrot on a string just out of our reach, and we keep trying to chase it and chase it, and one day I'm going to be in God's will. One day I'm going to be there. Sometimes it's described as some elusive place that you're going to wake up one day and just think, oh, I'm, I'm in God's will. That's not how it happens. That's not... God's will for your life, if we can say it in that way. He goes on in verse 18 and he tells us that God's will for your life is to be filled with his spirit. God's will for your life is to be filled with his spirit. I love interacting with with teens and college students. It's they've found themselves at at pivotal points in their life where for the first time ever, they're they're making big decisions. Decisions that will alter the course of their life. I've always said it's kind of unfair that our society makes you pretty much decide what you're going to be by the time you're 18 because I remember what I was like at 18. (laughs) I feel sorry for our teens. God's will for your life It's not a college, it's not a person to date, although those things come into play with it. God's will for your life is today, right here, right now, for you to be filled with the Spirit. For some reason, we preach to teens and college students a lot about, find God's will for your life, but we don't don't talk to senior citizens about God's will for their life. We, We assume that they're already there that they've already attained it. I don't mean to be harsh to some of you today, but I have met some senior citizens that are so far from God's plan for their life that it's sad. They are not living a life pleasing to God. They're not living a life that is being filled with the Spirit of God by any stretch of the imagination. It has nothing to do with your age, your station of life. It is all about you giving up and giving in to God. That's what God's will is for your life. He writes in verse 18, he says, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. That's God's plan. That's God's will. Be filled with the Spirit. In a strange way that I battle with sometimes when I read this passage, Paul uses the negative effects of alcohol as an example for what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit. I don't know that you can take this any other way. Here he he condemns drunkenness. He calls it dissipation. That's debauchery or moral looseness. We'll call it that. That might be the most understandable way to get this. Moral looseness, that's what drunkenness is. Paul says. The problem with alcohol is that it changes you into something else. It alters whatever your reaction, maybe it's rowdy or gloomy, that's how you term whenever you have a drink. It changes who you are from the norm. It makes you say things that you would not ordinarily say. It gives you an attitude that you would not normally have. It makes you do things that you would not soberly do. Let me, this is not the point of the the sermon, but it's important for us to note here that drunkenness will never solve a marital dispute. It will never help. 
marriage issues. It will only cause you to say hurtful things. Drunkenness will never alter your circumstances for the better. It will only change your attitude for a certain particular moment. And then you just wake up with a hangover. Drunkenness will never solve a problem. It will only create more. As hurtful and as dangerous and careless and as morally loose as drunkenness is, on the other side, you have the example of how helpful and secure and comforting being filled with the Spirit is. Alcohol makes you say things, it gives you a different attitude, and it makes you do things out of the ordinary for you, but so does the Spirit of God in you. But for your good and for His glory. In verse 19, he says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The Spirit of God indwelling a believer will make her sing to God for the benefit and the encouragement of all those around her. It will make you say things differently than what you normally do. When God is so filled, filling your life, when the Spirit is indwelling in you and you are allowing him to have full sway, he will change the way you talk. I love it. Seeing a new believer come to Christ and seeing the evidence, the fruit of the Spirit just kind of coming out. And and you see how a person deals with their wife differently. How they speak differently to those around them. That's what the Spirit of God will do. The negative effects of alcohol, they will make you spew filth and anger. But the Holy Spirit of God indwelling, living inside of you, will make you speak and say things that you would not ordinarily do. They would make you sing in a church service. How many of you five years ago, you wouldn't have found yourself dead in a church, but now you grab that hymn book, you looked up at the screen, and you sang as much as you possibly could because the Spirit of God indwelling in you alters who you are. It changes you. It changes how you talk. That's what it does. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. He goes on, though, in verse 20, he says, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God indwelling a believer will give him an attitude of gratitude towards God for everything in his life. It will change your attitude to everything. When you got drunk before you got saved, it would change your attitude. Maybe you were a jerk whenever you got drunk. I've heard some people may have been a little more palatable to other people when they got drunk. I don't know. But it changed how your attitude was. But here the promise is that you will begin when you are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Your attitude is now you see everything as a blessing from God given into your hands to dispense to the world. Your attitude has changed to one of gratefulness and thankfulness to God through our Lord Jesus Christ, he writes there. That's what the Spirit of God does when he indwells the believers. And he goes on in verse 21, because again, remember, it changes what you say, it changes your attitude. In verse 21, it talks about how it changes our actions. He says in verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. The Spirit of God indwelling a believer will make you do things for others that you would not normally do. It would make you serve. It will make you submit to another person. To find them more in favor than yourself. To think of others aside from your own self. It's so interesting what happens in the life of a believer If we just surrender to God, allow ourselves to be filled with him, and we reap these benefits, he changes what we say, he changes our attitude, and he changes our actions. That's what God does. So how ought we to live in this year? It's not necessarily an outline. It's one central command. Walk circumspectly. Be careful. Well, how do I walk carefully? Paul says to walk 
wisely? Well, how do I walk wisely? By redeeming the time given you. Well, how do I redeem the time? That's such a strange thought. By understanding God's will for you. Well, what's God's will for my life? To be filled with the Spirit. And when we come down to that, that God wants you to live a Spirit-filled 2018, it means that you give up everything that is you and you take up and take on everything that is of God. That if He convicts you of sin, that's it. It's out of my life. If you read it in Scripture, you obey. How ought we to live? Circumspectly, carefully, not safely. Don't don't confuse carefully and safely. We are to live carefully in this world because Scripture says here in in Ephesians chapter 5 that we are in evil days. Be careful how you walk. The whole point of this is to be filled with the Spirit. And when you allow the Spirit to come in and change you, He will change the way you talk, He will change your attitude, and He will change the way you act among other people. How ought we to live for God? Redeeming the time. Take every second captive. Don't waste one day. A couple of weeks ago, I had been in the office and things weren't coming quickly to me. I couldn't, I was trying to study for a sermon and I kept getting distracted and and things kept happening and I remember grabbing my coat and muttering under my breath as I was about to head home and thinking, I completely and totally wasted today. I wasted just about every second of my day. I tried to study, but I didn't have enough discipline to do that. Tried to make a visit, and the person wasn't home. I tried this, I tried that, and when you look at it, that day was wasted. And I honestly, thinking of Ephesians 5 a few weeks ago, knowing this day was coming, I started thinking about how horrible would it be if I were to stand before Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, hugging the beam, wasting my routine, wasting my my kairos, my lifespan, and then jumping off and saying, ta-da, Don't waste your life. Don't idle your life away by spending time at things that aren't going to matter for eternity. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your year. But look, a year is made up of 365 days. You're going to waste your year if you waste a day. That's what Paul is trying to get to the Ephesian believers and us today. For us to take Every second captive. You are no fool if you give up what you cannot keep to gain what you cannot lose. Redeem the time. What's God's will for your life? Be filled with him, emptied of yourself. Let's pray.